Okay, we're gonna we're gonna start uh, with uh, two more talks, um, and before I'm gonna introduce you uh, the next speaker, I want to point out at four fifteen we're gonna have the poster session. Um, there's gonna be uh, beer involved, um, and that means that we cannot leave this room. Uh, so the doors will close, and if you, as long as you have beer in your hands, if you can stay in this. Uh, in this room or or the next room that would be really great otherwise we're losing our uh, liquor license uh, here for, for these meetings uh, um that's about it i think okay so um let me introduce you uh, the next speaker um this is actually um julio julio won the uh, Savitsky student modeler award um there will be a little bit more around this event uh, during uh, the banquet tomorrow. Um, so I'm just going to introduce him. Uh, Julio uh, Hoffman Mendes uh, is from Stanford University, and he's going to uh, give a presentation about image quilt. So, Julio, please go. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Perfect. I turn it on. Hello. Okay. So, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, and uh, I would like to say that I feel honored to receive the award, first of all. Uh, I've been following the CMS community online for a while, and it's a model of open science research, and I really appreciate the award, so thank you very much. So in this talk uh, of today, or this award, uh, I would like to talk about uh, this idea of trying to better understand uh, the systems that we study. Um, and actually do it in a systematic way. And so I think it ties very well with some of the talks in this morning. Let's say I remember uh, Greg mentioning this emphasis or this theme of like modeling stream events and uh, the process of actually trying to get this data and make uh, some sense out of it or insight. Also from the talk of uh, Paul uh, this morning as well, he mentioned the fact that uh, some of these models, uh, we, we run them, we make these predictions of flood, but then at the end, we, the last statement, which is like what sounded to me, is that the fact that you have to also have an understanding of the uncertainty that goes with this. So the stochastic simulation must be there, and we need to somehow quantify this uncertainty. And even though this title uh, has a bunch of terms that are not well defined, I'll try to clarify some of them during the presentation. Uh, so I think to start with, I have to just give this example, which is, by the way, also in that poster there, just to show you how connected things are. Uh, this is the big event that happened in Japan, the, the Hoko earthquake. The idea here is that like, we have these models, right? So what happens when the model is off? The first thing uh, that I would like to point out is this quote by this, uh, I got it from Wikipedia, which says that the Hoko earthquake come, came as a surprise to seismologists. Why the, why the Japan Trench was known for creating large quakes, it had not been expected to generate quakes above an 8.0 magnitude. So it really tells that like, even though we have these models, it's really about understanding all the possible outcomes that these things can generate. It's not about a specific calibrated model that we care about. But when, this, when these models are off and we are not aware of these facts, things like this can happen. So uh, fundamentally, I think this research is mainly about trying to understand to what extent can these measurements and these observations that we make with physical experiments be used to improve our understanding of systems statistically? And how can we actually reproduce 
to be defined uh, these systems by some sort of statistics that you care about. So in this uh, slide, what I'm illustrating here in the left, this is an actual measurement taking at this from experiments that we are studying. And in the right is a completely made out synthetic model that I'm going to try to describe during the presentation. And the idea is how do we actually know if this model makes sense at all? Is it just like another model? How do we actually falsify these things? There are many practical challenges that I would like to just point out here that I think many of you will identify, which is, first of all, uh, there's a lot of amount of data that's being generated on these experiments, which is an unprecedented rate of data. How do you actually digest all of this data to, to make some insights, to make some conclusions? Second, I think everyone that plays with modeling and develops these models knows how frustrating can it be, or time consuming at least, to calibrate these models to observations. These models have a lot of unobserved parameters that go into them. And coming up with these numbers is really difficult. So there's always this challenge of like, OK, I have all these parameters that I don't know. I'll just set a specific number, and I hope or I believe I'll guess that things are going to uh, be OK. And so when I, they, when I say that the model is off, it's not only the physical model, the, the numeric code, but also the, this mental model of constraining yourself to pick a specific set of parameters. And uh, lately, is the fact that like, the predictive power that these models give you is usually uh, also attached to the specific physics that you're modeling, right? So it's the specificity of the problem that you're calibrating the model for, it doesn't generalize very well. So you, you slightly change the boundary conditions or something of that kind, and all the effort that you spend of weeks modeling some good parameters, in a sense, they go away. So the predictive power uh, is not often a very good predictive power. And so this key word, I think, for me is like uncertainty. And that, that's what our research group does, modeling this uncertainty explicitly. So in this research specifically here, I'm going to share with you this case study from experiments. And I'm going to try to go uh, on time. So uh, the idea here is that we have this from experiments, which are these videos that was being played in the previous slide. The simple observation that we make about this experiment in order to model it is this one, where we can look at the successive frames of this experiment in black white, uh, which is just threshold where the water is. And by computing an appropriate difference or a distance definition that captures morphology, I can produce this time series here, which just tells us that there's a very peculiar, even though it looks very random, there's a systematic evolution. Of course, it comes from a physical system, right? But the main important aspect or feature of this that I would like to highlight is the fact that there are big spikes interleaved with small variability. And so that's what we're uh, targeting here. In this modeling. So that's the main observation I had in the beginning. So develop this model. I want to replicate this. So what this model should entail then? So we came up with this uh, initial observation, and you then converted that into a mathematical model, right? So that's the first thing we do. This mathematical model consists of this small variability regimes interleaved with something that we still don't understand very well. So this we can model with any kind of shallow equations, simple simplified PDEs, or something of that nature, anything that uh, you can think of. The, the issue is like when it, we have the system, for some reason, or for some limited understanding, we, we're not able to get all the physics inside of it. So we're going to do a stochastic transition to some other state, which has some other duration delta t. This whole model, which is uh, known as a Poisson random process, has a parameter here, which is of big importance, which is the rate of events per unit time you see. And uh, it turns out that if you want to simulate a process of this kind, which is a continuous time process, you instead simulate the duration of intervals here by drawing from an exponential distribution. So you draw a time interval, you simulate with any model of, of, that you like, you perform a transition that I'm going to explain next, and then you keep doing this over and over again with the hope that you're going to capture those spikes that we have seen. So the first thing we do is parameterize these stochastic transitions. And the way I do this here is by uh, this trick here, which is I'll, I'll try to explain here. So basically, all, all that you're seeing here is all the images of the experiment. So we have a video. One of those that we're analyzing have seven of them. This is one of them. And the color bar here just represents time from purple to red. By doing some statistical manipulation, by defining this distance between shapes, which are these black and white images, each dot here is an image. 
the proximity of these dots in this 2D plane represent a proximity in shape. In that sense, you can see that this process uh, under this sense or under this distance definition has a, a starts here at this cluster of purple, jumps to something else, then jumps. There's this counterclockwise type of cluster that you're seeing. So the question is, we have all these images, right? There are a lot of them. We're not going to use all of them in our modeling. We're going to discard them. And I'm going to use just a few representative images from each of these clusters to represent the state. So we have a set of states. Each state has, a, uh, uh, let's say, a likelihood, which is the size of the cluster it belongs to. So if uh, I pick an image from here, I'm very likely to sample it more often than if I pick an image from a small cluster, correct? And there's also this transition probabilities that you can also model based on these things. So the idea is uh, we reduce the dimension or the, we parameterize the system by a reduced set of images. Now the question is, how can we reintroduce the variability back, right? So if you look here, the, this time series again that I'm illustrating, basically, I'm saying that these transitions that are being made are jumps between these clusters somehow. And now I'm going to reintroduce the variability in between. That's the image quilting part, where it comes from. So we, we wrote this paper in 2017, which is uh, a geostatistical algorithm that's purely data-driven. There is no physics going on. It's a complete uh, synthetic uh, fake process. But it's a process that's trying to reproduce the types of patterns that you observe on these images. So what this algorithm does is you give to it one of those representative images, and you additionally give some additional constraints, if you will, any type of remote sensing data, or if you actually have an observation at a particular point, the algorithm is capable of reproducing uh, that type of pattern. What it does is that given just a single image, it produces like random images, which have no physical sense, but they kind of reproduce the morphology in a sense of what the system is doing at that, at that state. And so what is the main advantage? First of all, we, uh, as I mentioned, it is able to capture the uh, uh, condition to data, and it's also very fast to run if you want to do Monte Carlo studies. And what we did then was, let's now generate fake videos with this model, the Poisson process plus the image quilting. And if you observe this black line, this is the original measurements of wetted area. Let's say I pick one property that I'm interested in, wetted area in the real experiment. And then I generate fake movies that produce to me fake time series as well. What you can do then is start evaluating, is this model useful at all, which is a completely made out thing. We can define some statistics that you care about. Let's say here's one example where I look at the Viagram, which is basically the autocorrelation of the series, to see if the model, that's all these curves that are generated from Monte Carlo, all these videos, if the observation that I've had is inside of this curve. So if it's inside, I cannot do anything. I can just move forward trying to falsify it further. And then recall the initial observation. Initially, we saw that type of spikes, right? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm generating fake videos and calculating the difference again to see a similar type of behavior of spikes. What is important here is because of extreme value theory and extreme value statistics, we can also start falsifying this model based on important statistics such as return levels. So we look at how much time we have to wait on average to see a, a, an event of magnitude x. And because we have the ability now to do the Monte Carlo in a somewhat efficient way, because it's like a purely uh, data-driven algorithm, there's no PD solving or anything that's super expensive, we can get also a confidence span, let's say, of the return levels, which is also very important. Finally, I think what uh, I'm also trying to aim for with this study or next steps is understanding how do we move from this flow process that we have just defined in, based on these image tricks to actually reconstruct, reconstructing stratigraphy. So there are a set of additional parameters that are currently studying, building this model on top that produces this type of models that are being generated here and illustrated in the first slide. And what we can do is that with this is also start trying to falsify or calculating the likelihood of this outputs each dot here is one 3d stratigraphic model that is being generated by the model and actual measurements in the tank so given all this 3d this is actually 3d i'm just illustrating in slices i can do some uh simple statistical operations to put it into this 2d space here and the colors here represent the likelihood of this observation being actually coming out of this process that i've just created and so what we are ultimately interested in is quantifying this uncertainty how how often our models are generating things that involve what we observe in nature. We are not constraining ourselves to a specific set of parameters. We are trying to randomize what we don't know. 
And so that's what Monte Carlo brings to us. And to end, I would like to uh, thank you again for, uh, for the award. And um, I think this quote also is very important. It's what kind of guides my research now, which is think simplicity and distrust it. So Alfred Whitehead is this creator of this branch of philosophy known as process philosophy. And I think that's kind of what I'm doing when I'm doing my research. I start with a very simplistic, in a way, sense model, and I try to falsify. If it's not falsified, I continue with it. If it's falsified, I try to add complexity. That's what I do. Thank you very much. Any questions, Julio? Well, it was a very clear talk, I think. Have been simulated by many, many different approach, different modeling techniques. And what is the biggest advantage of your technique? Or you produce with more accuracy, or you produce the saving time, or you, what is the advantage? Good question. So I think there are three main advantages. One is the fact that we are kind of trying to exploit the data that we collect. So everything here is made out of the data, not uh, in that sense. It's not necessarily the best thing in the world because, of course, we would like to introduce more physics. But you are able to actually condition the outputs of this model to whatever you observe. So if you know a priori that there's like a stream passing into a given location x, y, you can honor that type of information. The second thing is uh, the speed, as you pointed out. So if I want to do my quantification of uncertainty, I'm capable of doing my Monte Carlo in my laptop instead of having to require like a cluster of computing and wait a week to get some hundred models out. And I think uh, also the, the idea that this model is driven by that first observation that I showed you. If I want to make a decision at the end of the day or I want to study those return levels, I think I'm aiming with this model to reproduce those statistics, even though the physics is completely garbage. If the model reproduces the statistics that I care about, that's what I gain, right? So I don't care about the intermediates, but I care about the return levels that I get. So the model is developed for that specific purpose. If there are no further questions, then we can move on to the next speaker. So thank you.